afternoon. Um, this is a replacement recording. We unfortunately forgot to start the recording at the start of uh, USO's seminar. So welcome everyone today. Um, thanks for watching this online recording of USO's seminar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the country we are standing on today. Um, we are here on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and thank them for their care of the land. Uh, learning and education has happened for a very long time here and um, and I'd like to acknowledge that um, hopefully we are continuing on in this tradition uh, by having this seminar today. So I would like to introduce Dr. Yusu Nieminen. He is Assistant Professor at the University of Hong Kong. He's also a Banting Fellow at the Ontario Tech University, Canada. And most importantly for today, he is a Cradle Honorary Research Fellow. Um, so thank you very much, Yusu, for making it all the way to Melbourne and to sharing uh, for sharing your work with us. Um, so please. Thank you very much, Cho, for a lovely introduction. Um, so in this presentation, I will be talking about assessment and student identity formation uh, from the viewpoint of how students became uh, become uh, an abled or a disabled student uh, through assessment. Here on this first slide, you can also see my contact details. I will also share them in the uh, end of the presentation, but just to kick off the uh, the presentation. If you have any further ideas, thoughts, questions, please uh, do not hesitate to send me an email or contact me on Twitter with the handle Yusunieminen. Uh, in this talk, I will be focusing on three different uh, elements or parts. First, I will start by uh, theorizing. What are we talking about when we talk about assessment of student identities? And I will argue that assessment is first and foremost a matter of student identity formation. Next up, after doing a, a nice chunk of theorizing, I will uh, crown these ideas in empirical findings uh, based on my postdoctoral project. A few words about that uh, on the next slide. And I will address how students become disabled students through assessment. In the very final part of the presentation, I will briefly outline some future directions to assessment research uh, based on this theorization and these empirical findings. Um, the talk is based on a postdoctoral project that I conducted at the University of Eastern Finland in 2020 and 2021. The project considered inclusive assessment from the viewpoint of students with disabilities. Uh, and at the same time, I also focused on very much our exclusion, exclusive uh, assessment. The project consisted of a few different elements. I tried to uh, have a few lenses to look at this uh, issue of assessment from the viewpoint of, of inclusion. I conducted a qualitative service study, a narrative interview study uh, with uh, students with disabilities, a literature review, a policy analysis, uh, a few conce conceptual studies, and finally I have to note uh, that together with my colleague uh, uh, Henry Pesson, we published a research-based book for teachers on how to conduct inclusive teaching and assessment. Unfortunately that book is in Finnish, so uh, <laughs> Only a, a small amount of my the listeners would be able to uh, read that one. What I'm trying to say here is that this project really tried to cross this idea from a couple of uh, points of view. And today I will not so much just summarize what I did in this postdoc, but I will focus on what I learned from this project from the viewpoint of student identity construction. Before I can even begin, I must thank a couple of people. Now, I know that there are many others that I could thank here, because a lot of my work, a lot of my collaborative work touches upon, upon these topics. But I wanted to thank a few collaborators with whom I've been focusing on exactly uh, on the topic of assessment and identity formation. First of all, I wouldn't be here without our uh, Professor Baby Atmanen, who hired me to do my postdoc. A huge thank you for you, Baby, if you're listening, if you're having your morning coffee or tea in, in Finland. I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Lili Yang from the University of Hong Kong and Professor Annabel Morinia and Gilda Diagiotti from the University of Seville. All right, but let's uh, start off. So I will start with this rather brief theorization of what I mean when I talk about assessment as a matter of uh, student identities. My overall argument, the one thing that I hope you would all remember from, uh, from this seminar is that I do see assessment first and, firm, first and foremost as a matter of identity formation. In assessment research, we have a long tradition of focusing on student learning, of thinking about how assessment could promote and credential student learning. 
which is absolutely important. And this is something that we have to do in higher education. We have this uh, ongoing mantra in this literature that assessment drives student learning. And there's also criticism towards uh, this kind of an idea. However, I do think that even the critical voices uh, still often emphasize the idea of student learning, which again is, it, uh, uh, is very, very important and we can't ever forget that aspect. But today I would like to focus more on those long-term effects of assessment beyond those immediate learning uh, goals and outcomes that we want our courses to have in higher education. So what does assessment have to do with student identities? This might even seem like a bit of an alien idea for us working with assessment. Our whole understanding of assessment builds on these ideas of fairness, equality, and meritocracy. Assessment, at least in its ideal form, focuses on learning outcomes, whether they are cause or broken learning outcomes. And this is the basic way we think about assessment in higher education. And I would say this is the idea that connects people who think differently about assessment. And obviously there's nothing wrong about this kind of an idea. We do not assess our students' personalities. And you could easily criticize me if I would let my students' personality, personalities influence my assessment and grading practices. Uh, imagine, for example, that I would grade my female students with a lower grade. This, is, this would, uh, uh, could be justified as uh, to be an issue of equity. However, uh, what we miss when we solely focus on assessing course learning outcomes or program learning outcomes is the idea that assessment very much uh, shapes our students' futures and identities. I would say that this is something that we know as teachers and students in higher education and beyond. This is cultural and social knowledge that we carry with us, even though there might not be that much scholarly research uh, on this specific topic. Assessment in the end is all about those cultural narratives that we have about how we have been assessed and graded. You could think about your own strong memories that you have about assessment, those moments that you will not forget ever in your life about how you were assessed and created in your, in your own um, uh, previous educational pathway. Let me just show a very, very brief video of just one minute, which uh, comes from the context of China. And this high stakes uh, test of Gaoka that all Chinese students take part of before they are assigned to uh, higher education institutions. This video comes from a specific cultural context that has a strong cultural narrative of assessment and grades. And in the video, you can see that assessment is something that matters. It very much matters. Uh, and it most uh, importantly, is not something meaningless for, for our students. Let's see, we might get an ad, and we did. Uh, and we might get a sound, or we might not get a sound. Let's see. So in the video, you can see students getting their GARCO results. And you can uh, have a look at their reactions. You can think about whether you recognize some similar memories from your own education <laughs> after receiving test results or after receiving our decision letters from a university, for example. <laughs> Let me just show this one uh, that I think very Helpfully frames assessment. I cried while seeing uh, my assessment results. I think this video shows in a very powerful way how assessment influences our whole lives, our futures, and, and our identities, and how we recognize similar cultural narratives in different parts of the world, although, it, of course, in a bit uh, different kinds of ways. All right, uh, back to scholarly work from YouTube videos. How would I define the very complex term of identity or identity formation? Now, oh, this, is, this is a lot. I recently did a bit of a review, not a review that would end, uh, end up uh, as a publication, but just for myself. I looked at how many review articles I could find from publishing educational journals about student identities, and I could easily find over 100 of them. Um, this is a topic that has been studied a lot, there are a lot of different kinds of uh, ways of approaching the idea of student identities. And perhaps in a bit of an uncharacteristic way, today I'm not going to provide you one single definition and stick to that. I'm going to show you how I ground my work. Overall, today I will focus probably on students' professional identity for, uh, formation, how students form 
themselves as future professionals in their own field uh, as they're studying in higher education. I uh, understand identity formation as a social and cultural process. As students uh, study in higher education, they do not only learn certain things and get assessed, but they become a part of a professional community. And assessment plays a huge role here, which is exactly what I'll be talking about. So the question for us today is, how are student identities constructed by students themselves, as well as others around them? And what is the assessment? What is the role of assessment in these processes? One specific uh, uh, book that I would like to mention that has been very formative for my own thinking comes from uh, Rachel Brooks and, um, and Sarah Oshia, uh, which is on student constructions in higher education. Uh, this book, uh, I think, opens up a new area of research on how students are constructed by themselves and by others in higher education settings. And the authors denote uh, in the very first page of their book that uh, they still know relatively little about how students themselves understand their identity as students and how they are constructed as social agents. So what they do in the book is that they sum up research that we have so far and open up some future uh, pathways. And my argument today is that assessment research could very well uh, be following their arguments. And the role of assessment in students' identity formation might be quite specific, which is why it, uh, uh, why it makes sense to focus particularly on, on assessment. Well, what is special about assessment in relation to all other things that happen in higher education, such as teaching? Assessment is the one part of higher education that produces knowledge about students' abilities. It focuses particularly on skills and abilities. Uh, already back in uh, 1977, uh, Derek Rondry wrote a very uh, helpful book about assessment design, uh, which he named as uh, Assessing Students, How Shall We Know Them? I recently reread this book after a while, and it really inspired me to think about what this question could mean uh, for my own work. Indeed, how shall we know our students? We know our students through assessment. We know our students through that information, that data that assessment provides us. And what that data is, is data about student abilities. Every assessment situation provides new information about our students' abilities in relation to learning objectives, at least in an ideal state. That means that assessment is a mechanism for students to know themselves. Who am I as a future professional? Assessment provides a way for students to answer this question, which is why I think uh, Roundtree's uh, book is very much worth uh, revisiting even today. When it comes to assessment in particular, I think there's a specific ethical question of who assesses whom, who determines whose identity. And this is something that we've been uh, pondering with, uh, with my colleague, Dr. Lily Yang. Who assessment students are largely formed by others. We know the students are rather rarely being given opportunities to participate in assessment practice and policy design. Assessment policies and practices are mostly uh, formed by someone else, and these policies and practices in turn shape our students for the purposes also defined and shaped by others. These individual assessment practices may then have a long lasting effect on students' uh, professional identities, again, in ways that are determined by others. And this is very much an ethical issue. I specifically want to denote that I do not want to be deterministic. I do not mean that the assessment that we do as teachers determines anyone's identities. Absolutely not. Uh, even so, assessment often has the totalizing nature by using the concept of Stephen Ball. It has a seemingly objective nature, which gives it a particular power in determining someone's identities from afar. Even though, of course, we know that not all assessment simply sticks to our identities, which I think is very uh, nicely put in the work of our uh, Naomi Winston and colleagues in their, uh, in their paper called Check the Grade and Load Out, which is about students' disinterest in assessment and feedback information. So we, today, we do not need to be deterministic, but we do need to understand the issues of ethics when it comes to assessment and student identities. So to wrap up the first part of the presentation, let me just uh, summarize my argument so far. So my argument is that assessment does shape student identities, and it does so, and it does this by providing students building blocks for knowing themselves. 
this building block might be assessment and, uh, and feedback information. And these building blocks provide particular knowledge about student abilities above anything else. Now, let me show you how these ideas were seen in my data sets uh, from my postdoctoral study studies. In the second part, I will focus on the voices of disabled students, and I will show you what I mean with this term. When I look at the uh, outputs of my postdoctoral research project uh, today, I see these uh, outputs being about how a disabled student identity has been constructed in assessment. Assessment, as it provides knowledge about our abilities, it has this uh, ability to able and to disable students. It, by, by providing that information, it gives us a way to know ourselves as able or as disabled students. And what is very important to note here is that the disabled student doesn't exist in a vacuum. It, this student always exists in relation to the able student. And this is almost like a pair that you can never uh, separate from each other. Every time we talk about a student with disabilities, we only talk about that student in relation to students without disabilities. And these binaries are often in the core of student identity formation. And the role of assessment is, of course, uh, my focus here. So how is this kind of a disabled student identity construction seen in assessment policy and research narratives? And how are these public narratives then seen in the narratives of, of the students themselves. I also wanted to give a bit of a motivation for why I am focusing on uh, students with disabilities in my talk today. I think there's a lot of power uh, in learning from the anomaly. Learning from what we label in assessment to be an, an, an anomaly is something abnormal, something that we need to label as something different. And I uh, argue that this is not only about a specific student subgroup somewhere over there. But by focusing on the anomaly, we can actually learn a lot about assessment of all students. And in this work, I will indeed focus on those mechanisms that label certain students in assessment as different, as ontologically separate from typical students. And I will show that assessment plays uh, a rather major role here. Let me start with our uh, the first study that I did in my postdoc, which is about uh, disability identity constructions in as assessment adjustment policy. So this study was conducted in the Finnish context. I analyzed the assessment policies and practices in 10 Finnish speaking universities. Um, and in Finland, as in many other parts of the world, Australia included, there is a legal mandate to provide assessment adjustments to students with disabilities. This might mean, for example, extra time exams, or separate, test, separate testing rules. And in this work, I analyzed how these adjustments that are, of course, absolutely necessary, they are needed to promote equity in higher education spaces, how these practices construct students as someone, someone special, how these policy and practice documents portray students as special students who then require some special adjustments. I analyzed how the Finnish assessment uh, adjustment system constitutes a very careful and precise system of classifying students into different categories, surveilling that students stick to their own category, and suspicion about whether a specific student actually belongs to that category. I claim, by uh, borrowing a very useful uh, notation by Harry Torrance, that the assessment adjustment system, in a way, blames the victim. Um, even though these practices of assessment adjustments, again, I really want to highlight that these practices are needed. Uh, this is not a general criticism towards these practices, but a call for understanding the social uh, effects of these practices at the same time. These practices construct students with disabilities as a certain type of a category, a group of students. In doing so, it constructs disabilities as the issue to be noted, as, and as the issue to be somehow overcome and addressed. Meanwhile, it leaves the inaccessible assessment systems and designs uh, untouched. Importantly, uh, the assessment adjustment policies uh, in the Finnish context 
uh, what I found in the study was that they held students with disabilities responsible for change rather than assessment itself. Um, when it comes to student identity formation, I wanted to give you one specific example of my data set. Um, this is an excerpt from uh, instructions for sitting uh, examinations in a special room. And this is exactly the uh, notation that was used in the Finnish text by, by one Finnish university. And you can think about uh, how this text is speaking to the student who has to read through this document as they are taking their exam in this special room uh, because of their disability. Take your writing equipment out and hang your outdoor clothing and back on the rack in the door. Shut down your phone and put it in your bag or into the pocket of your jacket. There can be nothing else on the table, for example, a phone or a drinking bottle, unless you have special permission for that. Information about the approved adjustments is written on the exam envelope. It is forbidden to touch the computer, the keyboard, and the computer mouse in the room. You can think about what type of a construction is uh, present in this text. How are students with disabilities seen, surveilled, and, and what kind of a suspicion lingers around the whole idea of students with disabilities sitting their exams in this room? Uh, as someone who works in higher education, I would hope that no one ever speaks to me with this kind of a tone. It seems very alienating in a way, but this is the way we talk our students to uh, in our policy and practice documents. So that was the public discourse about students, with, uh, the identity construction of students with disabilities in assessment and adjustment policy. Let me then move on to another public form of discourse about uh, the very same issue. In another study of mine, I looked at the looked at how these disability constructed are present and portrayed in assess assessment adjustment research. I analyzed 26 journal articles that uh, focus on assessment adjustments for students with disabilities. And I analyzed how students with disabilities came to be understood as ontologically separate from the ideal and typical students in assessment. And this separation between students with disabilities and ideal students was made through valid and reliable research on cognition, often uh, based on ideas such as psychometrics. So this uh, ontological separation, this construction was very much real, very much uh, scientifically valid, and it was made to be so. I wanted to give you two student constructions that I identified from this research output uh, data set. The paper is called "Is Banner in the Works," uh, uh, and that very much summarizes how these students were constructed as a separate category from other students. The students were first and foremost uh, portrayed as potential cheaters. For example, one of the papers I'm not going to read through all of this, but one of the one of the papers uh, was really looking at how students might uh, malinger, which means fake their disabilities. And, and this study noted how ADHD is particularly easy to cheat and how that means that we need to be suspicious about uh, what types of students are applying for uh, assessment adjustments. Another study made a very strong case about student disabilities being a costly burden for universities and university systems. Here you can see some calculations about the money, the resources that these students, again, as constructed as a separate group from other students, uh, what kinds of services they take out from the system. And again, this is seen as a way to be suspicious about how we categorize the students. Now, these are the public discourses of, of, around how we construct this idea of a disabled student. How are these discourses then seen in the narratives of students with disabilities themselves? I did a, a qualitative survey study where I looked at uh, this issue specifically, and I found that the students uh, narrated their own selves as the others. Someone ontologically separate from the typical or even any students. One of the students uh, uh, wrote in the study that it feels like being labeled as invalid and disabled when you apply for help. Now that I've ended up studying at university, I feel that I just have to survive. Another student noted uh, being an extra burden for the university, which I think very strongly 
uh, portrays the public discourses of, around how certain students take more resources from uh, higher education institutions. I feel embarrassed to ask examiners to take notice of me and arrange my own proctor and special room for exams, which was a reason for the student not to do that, not to apply for the support they would have needed. So this is why I think we need to be very careful about the public discourses we have around certain identity uh, constructions and categorizations. Another construction that was very much present in this study was the category of the slow ones. This was uh, something that students belonging to many disability uh, classifications wrote in the study. For example, one student noted that there are no assessment practices that don't suit me, just ones that I need, I need more time with. Again, I think this uh, tells something rather important about assessment overall. Our assessment practices are based on a specific understanding of time and a specific understanding of students who can fit that uh, structure of time. The second uh, student construction that I uh, portray in this slide was a bit hard to name, but a lot of the students in this study were writing about inaccessible assessment design. Uh, this student uh, uh, on the slide was studying accounting, and the student noted that in one of their courses, uh, oh, sorry, in most of their courses, assessment is based on exams and overly long essays, as the student uh, puts it. Uh, in, and in doing so, they do not focus on those more authentic practices that actual uh, accountants would actually need in their future lives. This is an accessibility issue, huh? and this is something that we know based on research. Inaccessible assessment causes barriers for students with disabilities. What I want to emphasize here is that this is also a matter of identity formation. How these inaccessible practices might uh, end up uh, with students' own narratives about themselves as being wrong types of, ler wrong ty uh, types of learners. Finally, I wanted to give a um, bit of a, a sneak peek for my uh, upcoming work, where I wanted to go a bit deeper by looking at our narrative interview data on how uh, students with disabilities construct their own identities in assessment. It's, a, it's very much a follow-up study for this previous uh, survey study. Going a bit deeper into what is the student's own agency in these processes of identity formation? And the key finding here is that uh, students really have a, a, a profound amount of agency over their own assessment tasks and, and designs. And this is, again, something that we already know based on assessment research, but I want to reframe this issue as a matter of identity formation. Many students who participated in my interviews, uh, in fact, noted that they came to the interview situation because they want to uh, provoke some kind of a change and they have been unable to do so. And now they hope that through this interview, something would happen in this world. And this presentation is very much a part of that uh, mission of, of, of mine. One of the students noted in an interview that there is no way for our students to have a say on, on assessment. Um, the student also notes that uh, they had a they have a friend who studied in the same uh, program ten years ago, and the same issues of assessment were already present back then. And the student notes, "How is it possible that nothing happens in ten years? How much do teachers care about the voices of our students?" And this student, uh, uh, who had a learning disability, uh, use uh, uh, a good amount of time to talk about how frustrating it is to want to have a change on more inclusive and accessible assessment practices but as a student being unable to do so and i think this uh, quote really sums up the, the view of the student another thing that the students noted in the interviews was that assessment is often designed by normals and here i used a specific term used by um, the second student whose uh, quote i show on the slide um, so assessment is often designed by, uh, by teachers who may not struggle with similar kinds of issues. Uh, one of the students noted in an interview that assessment provides you with a frame and you need to be a certain kind of a student to fit that frame. Multiple choice questions are an integral part of law studies, what the students are studying, but I think they favor a certain type of a learner. Another student noted that it always stresses me out in exam situation to know that there are so many normals who can write faster than me. It makes me depressed. And here, this is a direct translation from Finnish. This person was not talking about normal people, but was using the specific notation of a normal as a noun to refer to other students 
And I think this is also a very powerful way of looking at how the student is reflecting their own self in relation to others. The student did not be, see themselves as a normal. And here again, I think the, you can quite powerfully see how these students struggle within the structures around their own agency that is not uh, designed by uh, these abnormals, uh, again, as by using the, the notation of the student. Finally, I wanted to give you another example of a study led by um, led by uh, uh, Zheng Hinki in, at the University of Hong Kong, who is studying the identity construction of teacher candidates uh, in teacher education programs in Hong Kong. And there was a very uh, interesting narrative interview that I wanted to share with you, uh, conducted with uh, Steve, a teacher candidate with a disability, who was sharing how they feel like their own teacher identity has to be separate from their disability identity, their personal identity. The student notes that teachers are usually expected to be role models for students. So if having a disability is not decided, uh, is not the desired model in society, then obviously I can't bring it into the classroom. This I think uh, shows how the student is, you could, you could analyze this in a few, a few different ways. You could argue that the student is using their own agency to separate their identities from each other. Or you might also argue that the student is, what, what is happening here is a lack of agency in how these different identities in, uh, intertwine and, and get untangled or indeed separated. I think this story is a very powerful one to, for us to think about what type of an assessment would allow our students to show their identities in assessment in ways that are seen as socially accept acceptable. So to wrap up this second part of the part of the presentation, let me summarize my argument so far. So my argument has been that assessment shapes students' identity formation by categorizing students, dividing students, and selecting students. And these abilities and abilities are at the core of, of these processes. Finally, I would have a few implications for assessment research. I'm just going to wrap up. I only have a few uh, slides left before opening up the room for uh, discussion. Based on these developing ideas, I, I would like to note a couple of uh, future trajectories for assessment research. First of all, and this is uh, really the, the key argument here, we need to understand the processes of identity formation in and through assessment. Um, in 2006, uh, Barrow wrote quite uh, nicely uh, uh, in his paper uh, about assessment and identity transformation that we need to link uh, assessment links the character of our students and the intellect of our students. And I think this study provides us the means to start thinking about assessment as that social mechanism that connects our abilities and our identities that we often see as something separate in assessment situations. If learning in higher education means to become someone, to become a part of a professional community, then we do simply do have to understand the social functioning of assessment in these processes of identity formation. Luckily, as I noted in this slide, there, there's a lot to draw on. We already have a lot of research on identity formation in higher educational settings uh, and in education more, more broadly. So we certainly have a lot of knowledge that we can bring to our world of assessment and feedback research. I think there's also a lot that we can learn from the viewpoint of inclusive assessment. We tend to think about inclusive assessment as a matter of access, which is crucially important. We absolutely need to make sure that our assessment is accessible uh, for students with disabilities and for, and for all students. But we also need to understand the influence of our accessible and inaccessible practices for student identities. And I just wanted to note that I, in this uh, poster project, I produced um, one paper in which I uh, open up this uh, this solution a bit more called assessment for inclusion. Uh, if, if, if you want to look at the whole story, you can you can have a look at the article. It's it is open access. Finally, there is definitely a need for longitudinal research. We cannot talk about student identity formation without mentioning longitudinal research projects. When we understand assessment as a matter of being and becoming in higher education, we do need to capture these moments as they occur uh, through longitudinal science. 
And what I would particularly welcome are research approaches to look at these moments, these micro or macro moments of uh, disabling and enabling that assessment does for our students in the social world. And from the teaching point of view, uh, I can bring the same argument by noting that we need programmatic assessment that takes into account these processes of student identity formation. How could assessment support all students' identity formation in ways that are formative and constructive for our students? Now, I'm definitely not the first person mentioning about this topic. There is already uh, there are already pockets of inspiring examples out there in the in the literature. Uh, there's emerging uh, knowledge coming up from the, the about uh, programmatic assessment, touching upon the, the issue of identity formation as well. There's a tradition of uh, studying journals and e-portfolios as particular assessment practices that are uh, tapped into this idea of student identity formation. So there's a lot going on already. Wonderful pockets of uh, inspiring examples that we could use and perhaps come up with a bit more comprehensive ways of looking at how assessment shapes our students' identities along their studies. All right, let me wrap up by summarizing my argument today. So my argument is that assessment is all about being and becoming. So now what? What are we going to do with this knowledge? What are our next steps? And I would love to have a further conversation about, about this topic. <clears throat> Here you can see my contact details. Again, if you have any further questions or ideas, that you still want to share uh, after this uh, discussion, please let me know. Here's my email and my Twitter handle. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yusso. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the chat online. Wonderful. Um, but no questions yet online. So uh, as Margaret has also invited everyone online, please pop them into the Q&A and we can um, take them as they come, but I will give the opportunity to someone in the room first, and I might ask for a question from a student in the room. <laughs> first. And maybe you, did you have your hand up? I did. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I My question is with regards to some of the themes that were coming up with the, the students, like the othering, the extra burden, and it really, um, it seemed to remind me that like so much of these um, the ideas of inclusivity seemed really bound up with just marginalization in general, like black, black, you know, just anyone who's marginalized, queer people, black people, um, just other people of color. So my question then is, what are your thoughts on inter, um, the importance of intersectionality? Thank you. That's a very wonderful thing to know. I, I, I don't think we can do this kind of research without being intersectional. Um, in assessment, we too, do tend to think that abilities are something separate from the persona, mm -hmm. the identity, mm -hmm. and we are we will focus on our assessment on those abilities. But of course, in reality, it's a bit more untangled. And I would say that the very idea of an ability that is never kind of free of those things that happen in our social world around us, they are never pure in a way, separate from our identities. And to unpack these processes, we simply need to be intersectional. And what this means in certain disciplines, certain uh, contexts, is uh, we simply need to address that. For example, coming from my own disciplinary background of mathematics education, uh, I very easily note the uh, ideas of uh, gendered or racialized uh, notions of what it means to be mathematically able. Mm -hmm. So I think that's our only way to go. I think it's impossible not to be intersectional in this kind of work. Um, Dave? Um, thank you. I, I found that very stimulating and it's a very useful perspective to bring, uh, especially in contrast to our normal perspective on assessment. Um, well, one of the things I, I, I noticed was this kind of the, the, the feedback between these two perspectives. A, a lot of what you were saying from your uh, disability studies was really a critique of the normal ways we think about assessment as measuring learning. In one mm. sense, and you you could read a lot of the things that you were describing as a critique of the validity of assessment practices. I mean, and that positions mm. it back in the, the the kind of conventional way of mm. assessment. So that um, what what you had was a whole lot of data which says that this is not uh, addressing learning outcomes. These are invalid measures that don't enable us to make 
legitimate judgments about students for the various reasons you described. Um, I think that's that's a very powerful critique, mm. and it underpins uh, a lot of the discussions that are emerging about assessment for inclusion and how we need to reconceptualize um, assessment from that perspective in order to make it more open, more inclusive, and so on and so forth, both in your work and in the work that came mm. out of the symposium we did here. Um, I'd like to just take it one stage further and ask you to elaborate on the, um, the positive identity, uh, identity formation mm. that occurs through assessment. So a lot of your um, illustrations from the disability area were really um, stigmatizing people with disabilities in various ways. Mm. So they were kind of very negative identity, identity formation practices going on there, which you exposed. Mm. Can you say a bit more about how uh, assessment in what, how the way you're thinking about it creates more positive and constructive notions of identity uh, rather than just look the, the limitations of assessment on identity, identity formation? Thank you, Dave. This is, a, this is a wonderful question, and I hope to devote the next 20 years of my life to <laughs> research this, uh, this idea. I'm trying to summarize my thinking about this so far. Um, I think one aspect of that is to use assessment practices, such as self-assessment, that would make these processes of identity construction or formation visible and transparent for students, to make them understand the processes as well. That's one, perhaps a bit of an easy solution for this. Like, um, I think it's I think it's a lot about also working around in spaces beyond assessment. Um, in my disability related data sets, these students whose are quotes are introduced in the slides, they are not underachievers. They are not students who would be struggling in their studies. In fact, some of them are doing extremely well in their studies. But even then, assessment stigmatizes them and marginalizes them. So a big part of this would be to work around, for example, anti-ableist cultures in our institutions, do other type of work that then reflects on our assessment practices. So we definitely need to have a systematic and systemic way of looking at how we get rid of that stigma, which we can see in assessment, but it's not assessment specific as an issue. This is just some of the ideas that comes to mind. Programmatic assessment is uh, one notion that I was thinking when I was um, preparing the presentation. <laughs> I think that's a bit of an uh, easy way out. I think it's uh, started to do that in my work. I always provide programmatic assessment as a solution for everything. <laughs> and I'm starting to be pretty close towards that as well. But um, these are my thoughts so far. Just one follow up. And do you have any examples of positive identity, identity formation from? existing assessment practices. Positive identity construction. Do you want to follow up on that or? Then I'm asking, I'm going to ask. I've got so many questions yeah, online. There, so I'm there representing. Are, there are online questions. And I think. But I can answer them. that question, <laughs> just because I'm here. We're doing a workshop about Huskies. <laughs> um, so do you want to, do you want to? I was just jumping. I really just was here. What? Yeah. yeah, some some and actually there is a question online that has three upvotes, so not the top question, but directly links on from Dave's question. Yeah. Did you find examples of practice which may have supported or affirmed identity development? Any any excellent examples as opposed to all the bad ones? <laughs> yes, a lot of them. And um these students who are not experts in assessment design were actually providing rather sophisticated ideas of how to improve assessment and how to analyze the existing assessment practices. And one of them is, sorry, to throw in another uh, buzzword, but authentic assessment, that's something that has been seen in many of my data sets. Assessment practices that have been very practical in a sense that really transparently make explicit what kinds of skills and practices the students will need in their future lives, in their future work and, and, and in their lives beyond work. That's something that was uh, described by students coming from various disciplines. And often the students were comparing those uh, essays and exams with these uh, experiences of actually being able to live through authentic assessment. 
Um, Margaret, are you in charge of online questions? Well, I will. I'll ask the next one because you, you're already skipping through. But anyway, I've got a question from Kwan Liu here. Sorry, apologies for pronunciation. Thanks, you so. I'm a fan of the conceptual paper and scoping review. You are led on technology authentic assessment. Uh, authentic assessment. Would you be able to comment on the relationship between assessment as identity development and conceptualizations of authentic assessment as mirroring the real world task? The authentic self, and even Jane MacArthur's, Jan MacArthur's societal transformation. Uh, and this is linked a little bit to question two. Do you think student identities also influence how they approach assessment? Oh, bringing in all these cool buzzwords. I like this. Um, I think authentic assessment, if we take that approach of uh, Jan, Mac Jan MacArthur, it's all about identity construction. How would it not be if through these tasks, through this assessment task, students really take part in this world, they take part in this society and do something actually meaningful in authentic ways. That for me is all about you developing your professional identity as a student. So in my mind, this, this, all these concepts are, they really come together in this way. Thank you. Um, Jo, do you want to go to Tim's question? Yeah. Next, I guess. So, um, and sorry, the, the, the follow-on question from David did come from Lincoln James, and now this question is coming from Tim Horn. Established practitioners are embedded in normalised and historical practices and surrounded by others who have developed normalised ways of fitting in. How might we help them imagine other ways of being that kind of professional? Excellent question. Uh, to me, the first thing that comes to mind is representation. Uh, this is certainly something that I've seen in my data sets all the time. Uh, we talk a lot about disability representation, for example, but I've seen way less conversation about disability representation in assessment, now in assessment tasks, assessment situations. Uh, that's certainly one way of promoting uh, representation is one way of uh, countering these more historical narratives around who is a university student, who is a non-typical university student. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. I don't know, Tim, if I really answered your question. It's it's, it's a big one. Any more questions from the room? Yeah. Yeah. Tim Corcoran in the room. <laughs> okay. uh, thanks, you. So that was great. Uh, Tim Corcoran, I'm from Deakin University. Um, I just wanted to check with you how you're conceptualizing things here. Okay? So um, you tied identity to social and cultural work mm. and yet the slides invoked things like personality and cognition so i just wanted to check with you whether was it simply an oversight or in the words of a famous irish band have you still not found what you're looking for <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a bit of a both. Uh, I mean, in, in my work, I most certainly do not work with this uh, more positivist understandings of personality. That's completely out, out of my scope. Um, but I did for, analyze those kinds of approaches in, for example, in the literature review, when I analyzed earlier assessment adjustment studies. Uh, when it comes to your wonderful uh, quote, um, that, that's certainly, that, that's true. My, my argument is that we do need to start unpacking these processes and I'm on the beginning of that journey. So as I said, I provided a very uh, broad positioning towards how I see identity construction. That's only the starting point. Of course, we need to, in future work, we need to be way more specific, probably use one specific framework for this. My key point here is that it certainly has to be seen as something social, cultural, also political, when we talk about things like uh, abling and disabling assessment. Uh, rather than perhaps the more cognitivist, uh, what, what the cognitivist approach could, could come on. Just to add that, you know, I, I think there are some alternative psychologies out there that might be of assistance to you. Absolutely, and, I'm not, and my point is not to say that a, a specific framework is the only one that should be used. No, we need a plethora of approaches and, and ways of looking at what's, go, what's going on. So we're almost at the hour and usual cradle practice is that we formally close for all the people who might need to head somewhere else at the hour. Um, and then we will continue the question and discussions after this point. And for those in person, we will also have some afternoon tea, I believe. 
Um, so before, so thank you, you so, uh, and everyone for joining in in this discussion. Um, our next seminar is on May 10. We have two cradle doctoral graduates who are joining together to be talking, uh, sharing their research on productive feedback practices to facilitate student engagement and learning. Um, so please join us next time. I'll pop the link into the chat. Uh, the time is a little different because uh, NASA is um, indeed not in Melbourne currently. Um, so thank you all um, for everyone who has to go and we'll now keep on going. Um, room versus online, where should we go? Does anyone else in the room have a... I have a comment because it's going to, take, it's going to be a little long. I'm going to walk you through it. <laughs> so I was reading, does anyone, if anyone knows Sarah Ahmed, who work on complaint. So I was reading that earlier in the week and I noticed a lot of what she says about what it's like to complain at the university. It's a bit like what it's, what it's like to ask for an accommodation or adjustment at an assessment, that it, it takes you out of your normal role as a student or as a staff member. It places you in a box where you're a problem because you're pointing out a gap or an inefficiency at the university. So immediately you're sort of, um, you come from a place where other people might see you as a problem, right? Like what you were saying as mm. well. Now, in her work, she talks about how there are more and more people who um, reject the idea of creating policy or other types of institutional mechanisms to um, avoid complaint or avoid, in your case, extensions, because this masks the underlying issues and takes us away from having genuine conversations about diversity, inclusion, so on. But what, where are your thoughts? I mean, I know there's a, there's a lot of talk about universal design, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm. And sometimes I wonder if that is a bit like policy, just masking conversations that we could be having with each other. Oh, yeah, another big question. I, I, I would always be a bit careful about answering these questions on like a universal, like a super macro level, as if it would be a a contextual question. This would be a very different question in different nations with different higher education policies, with different accessibility policies and so forth. But generally speaking, yes, of course, I'm taking that point of view that those like simple solutions such as perhaps universal design, of course, they do not completely tackle the issues that we have in the in our practices. Uh, I've been writing about, for example, in the specific uh, space of disabilities, I've been writing about anti-ableist approaches that would take a systematic and sorry, systemic approach to changing higher education uh, and particularly changing teaching and assessment practices, which uh, has to concern our assessment and teaching design, but also the other thing around that. So when it comes to, uh, for example, these extensions or all types of ass assessment adjustments, uh, they are in, in themselves social and political practices. The very same practice can be just like a, day-to-day -day normal practice, you ask me for some extra time. Or it, this very same practice in another context might be a very stigmatized, marginalizing practice. In a, in a um, interesting way, I had uh, one student who shared in an interview that it would be easier if they would just be in an accident and they would need to ask for an extension because of their broken leg. But when you need to ask for extensions because of your mental health issues, it's the same practice but a very different type of a social, cultural, societal stigma around it. So the solutions, this goes back to Dave's question, question before, it needs to be systematic and systemic, or is this way interchangeably. So no, it can't be just a one university design practice. I've got a follow on. Yeah, this is actually a question question, not yeah. me. Um, so one of the questions, what, something that's really going through my head right now is we're talking about, um, ability, disability, and how they construct each other. The other, the big elephant in the room when it comes to assessment is failure. You know, people who fail, yes. people who pass. That is, you know, in a way, what assessment is designed to do, to do. And I wonder if you've given any thought, I and mean, I'm really thinking about your work here a bit, Roller, um, about, um, and also about underperformance. I'm thinking about how students who underperform. This is also an identity issue. Yes. And, and, and whether in some ways, um, if we could lighten the load 
on that division, whether that would sort of ripple out to everything else as well too. I'm not saying it's quite the same problem, but I'm just wondering if, if we're talking about intersectionality, if that might be. Um, I, so I'm interested in your thoughts, basically. I'm just not. Thank you. This is an excellent point. This is something that I, I haven't addressed in my own work, and I realise that it's kind of a, it's a spot that I have missed. This is, yeah, th this is very important because I think that a lot of the assessment work and administration that we need to do as teachers is actually focusing on other things rather than on making sure that our students feel certain standards. And I think the system that we have is framing failure in a way that is not very constructive. My two cents on this issue, and we have better professionals in this room, I'm staring at you right now, but my two cents would be that if I would be very glad to actually promote failure way more than we are doing at the moment, make sure the students meet certain standards and support them and scaffold them, uh, pay attention to the identity formations while we're doing so, and simply to frame failure as something that is integral to learning in higher education. It has a very different cultural connotation in many contexts. Um, and, and I think this is exactly one of these issues that requires us to focus on assessment design and focus on all things other than assessment design. So uh, another question from the from online from Courtney, a um, little bit more practical perhaps. Um, where can institutions start in accessible assessment design and planning that helps promote positive student identity? Okay, I could speak for three months, so let me just say one thing. Uh, student partnerships. Uh, that's my brief answer today. If students are not part of these practical solutions, implementations, then we've missed a huge, huge opportunity and we're not hearing the actual end users of our practices. And I would particularly uh, want to emphasize the importance of seeing students as partners in assessment adjustment design. And these, uh, these practices are a very good example of something that is predominantly designed by someone else and students very rarely get their voices heard in what types of adjustments actually help their learning support them. So student partnership. Thanks, nice one. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna ask this one, because uh, it's interesting to me. Um, so Imelda Ghazali says, I'm a novice researcher, and I recently introduced chat GPT to my students as automated writing evaluation tool. In the end, some were excited about it, some stuck to Grammarly, and others didn't use it at all. Some of them said, the sophisticated corrections ChatGBT made is not me. Is this also a case of students expressing their identity, or is this something to do with digital feedback? Interesting. Yeah, I should have prepared something for anything related to ChatGBT, <laughs> and I didn't. We're for a professional failure. <laughs> I mean... I guess it can be very much related to identity or then not at all. I use Grammarly in every single sentence that I write in English. Being a Finnish person, I could speak and work in English for next for the next 20 years and I still don't get my prepositions right. So without Grammarly, my prepositions, they're always 100% incorrect. Is that a huge deal when it comes to my identity? Perhaps not. Um, I've, when it comes to assessment design, I would want to see more emphasis on how we could train students to operate in the digital world by using the digital tools in authentic ways because that's what they are going to do as future professionals and that identity construction i think is a, of course a big part of that this is a very unorganized question to this practical yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting in your case, though, they uh, say, well, it's okay, my identity as a Finnish person means that I know that I'm going to be bad at English prepositions, and that's part of me, so I'm going to use that tool. Whereas it sounds like these students are kind of saying, well, it doesn't sound like me anymore when I have the thing to remodel my sentences. So. Which is very interesting. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully there will be more research on <laughs> Gen <laughs> AA and, and, and identity constructions. Sounds like a very fruitful way for to get funding at the moment. <laughs> Any other questions in the room that might have been stirred for comments, thoughts? A question. Well, um, just going back to the promoting failure as a process for learning, um, I guess from an institutional uh, perspective, there's 
or challenges with that because of the financial implications for a student. Um, every time a student fails, they have to re-enrol into the unit of study and pay uh, for that unit. And so there are, if we're talking about intersectionality, we've got to look at poverty and disability. Um, and, you know, anecdotally, I see students that just drop out because financially they can't afford to fail. Um, so I'm not sure what my question is. It, it, how do we, I guess, how do we as an institution change those structures to, yeah, I don't know I, what the solution is. Unfortunately, I don't have a solution for you. If I did, I would probably be very rich and successful. But um, this is an excellent and very, very important comment. And this is something that uh, the students, in particularly in the service study of mine, they really noted the same thing. And often I think when we, sometimes we talk about these ideas of social construction, this identity construction as a social process, we tend to think about it as something abstract. What I learned based on this data is that it is actually something very real for these students. Because the students in this data, they said exactly that. They failed. They, some of them needed to uh, postpone their graduation, even for years, because of inaccessible assessment practices. So assessment played a huge role in a very tangible way in how these students failed. And many of them uh, described poverty. And one student in, in one of the interviews, uh, when I asked, how would you improve assessment design from your point of view? And the student just laughed and told me, you need a basic income. <laughs> and, I, that, and I really I remember that moment in that interview for a long time. It's yeah, thank you. That's helpful. I had a similar question um, to you, and it reminded me of a talk you said that um, Joe and a few others went to about the troubling the doctoral hierarchies and about the, um, yeah, like, like funding and failing, right? And so what Dr. Hyatt was kind of saying was, which I think you might be interested in, so that's why I'm sharing it, is that basically, um, and that reminds me of the, the video of the grading that you put up, um, because when I saw that video, I thought, well, it's not, it's, it might not be just about the grade, but it's about, about the fact, like what the grade affords. And like here, right, like if you get, say, you know, if you're entering a PhD program and you get like an HD, then that kind of puts you into the running of being competitive for a scholarship, right? So it's kind of like these, like you're, yeah, you get access to these professional communities based on your, yeah, like, so I don't know what, um, what I'm necessarily trying to say, but I just thought it was really interesting. It made me think of Dr. Hyatt's work. And if you have anything to say about that, then it's just. I don't know if I have anything to add. I simply think that what you're saying is extremely important, and what that what this all means for identity construction is a it's a massive uh, big question to be answered. Mm. And no, no easy solutions here, <laughs> unfortunately. No, on the no easy solutions <laughs> note, which reminds us all that we all should work a little harder um, and be a little bit more expansive in how we think about things. Um, I think we should wrap things up. There's probably some rewards for us outside. So thank you once again, Miso. It's been a pleasure. Um, and we hope to continue our discussions here for a long time. Wonderful. Thank you so much.